to Christ Disciples Institute once again. We are in session two, Christian Dynamics. Last week, we did CD 201, Understanding Deliverance. Today, we are taking the second course in session two, The Dynamics of Divine Love. CD 202. So, wherever you are, just take up your pen. For those of you who are students, take note of all that will be said because it's part of your evaluation. For the rest of you, please pay strong attention and learn whatever the Lord will be teaching us tonight. Like I said, today we are continuing in session two. Christian Dynamics, and the course today is CD202, The Dynamics of Divine Love. The text we'll be reading tonight is 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 10. 1 John chapter 4, from verse 7 to 10. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for us our sins. Hallelujah. Take note of the text we have just read and uh, the lesson that will follow in points. First of all, the dynamics of divine love is all about the power of God's love, the supernatural force or the power of the love of God. It points to what the love of God can do. The glory, the love of God produces. And so that is what dynamics of divine love is all about. It's about the power. Dynamics talks about power. From the word dynamo, which is force, active force. Force that makes changes. Force that makes things happen. So we want to look at the power and the force inherent in this love of God. Divine is of God. Anything divine is said to be of God. So divine love is God's love. Okay. Now, what is this love of God? The love of God is his nature. The place where they say, for God is love. He didn't say, for God has love. He said, for God is love. That is his nature. That is all about him. It is who he is. It is what is embodied in the physical body that we call Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of God in the flesh. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, we see Jesus pointed, that the Jesus Christ is pointed out in that uh, verse 13, chapter 13, verse 13 of 2 Corinthians, that Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the love of God. In fact, usually we see it as our benediction in church. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the free fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now forevermore. Amen. Now, most times we quote it wrongly. We say, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The actual thing there is, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the manifestation of the love of God, be communicated to us. That communion, that fellowship is called communication. Being communicated to us by the Holy Spirit. So here, he's saying that Jesus Christ is the love of God. In John 3, 16, we see it say, For God so loved the world. And what did he do? He gave his son. So the son is the product of his love. Or so to say, the manifestation of his love. God loves. And the highest thing that his love can do for man is redemption. And that redemption is packaged in his son. He said, and God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. So 
the embodiment of whatever God intended to do for the redemption of mankind is in his son. And that redemption is, a, is based on his love. Hallelujah. So to understand this divine love, let's look at the root word. Now the Greek word used in referring to God's love in 1 John chapter 4 where we read is agapas or agapan. Now, what does it mean? Now, if you look at that agapas, it has the flavor of judgment or deliberate choice. Judgment in the sense that it is talking about what one have decided. You see, now it is God saying, this is my decision. This is what I have decided. Just like when a judge in the court is giving his final decision, he sits with his red cloth and says, this is my judgment. This shows the gravity of God's love. God's love is his choice. It is not something that is as a result of your action. It is what God has decided to do. Hallelujah. God, unlike the human judge, cons does not consider uh, uh, points. You know, let me hear from you. Just like the human judge will say, you hear from the prosecuting counsel, you hear from the defense counsel, then you make a decision. No. He had already made his decision before you were born. He had decided that in him, in his son, you are already loved. You see, so God's love is the love that carries the flavor of judgment, which means it is his decision. Judgment does not mean condemnation. Judgment here means decision. Hallelujah. So he loves you not conditionally. He loves you unconditional. It is not based on your loving him. It is not based on how nice you have become towards him. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. Everybody on earth is loved by God. Whether you love God or you don't love God or God loves you. Whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God or God loves you. Whether you curse God or, or you disgrace God or, or any type, whatever you like, you do. As long as God is concerned, God loves you. But the power of that love is made manifest in you when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that God loves you does not necessarily mean that you will not be sent to eternal damnation if you refuse that love. Just like no matter how a young man loves a young lady, no matter how much he loves and cares for her, if she refused to accept his proposal for marriage, she will never become Mrs. that person. So when I say God loves everybody, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter where you are, it doesn't mean that because God loves everybody, you are saved. No. Your salvation, therefore, is a, is, is a you know, response. It's based on the response you give to the love of God. God's love for everyone is unconditional. God just loves you because of who he is. He cannot but love you. He loves by choice. Simple. He does not love because of any condition. He loves by choice. For example, one can decide to do something. You know, I say, okay, today all my students, I'm giving you credit. Everybody gets credit. I remember the first time we, 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 were, in the, we were still in the training, the, the commandant came to the camp and he said, everybody who came for training, who didn't miss their training today, they are one step ahead. Whatever rank you have after your training, we'll give you an extra rank just because you're here. And we are all excited. Everybody put down their names so that after the training, when the ranks will come, if, if you are given the rank of a superintendent, you know that you become a chief superintendent. If you are given the rank of a corporal, you know that you become a sergeant, you know. Everybody that has been already is, is free for everyone, but it is only for those who were able to come for training that particular day. So from the text we have just read, we see that God's, God's love is his choice. You see, God's love is his choice. Say, in this was manifested the love of God towards us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. God's love is manifested in Christ. In fact, it is the advent of Christ that shows how much he loves us. He said, hearing is love. Not that we love God. Not that we love God. But that he loved us 
and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he says, He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. And Jesus was not made this the day you were born. Jesus was already made what he will be before we became what we became. The Bible says he's the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. God's love was what led him to create man. He loved this species called man. That is why he took his time to create him to be in his own image and his likeness. To the point that even when man fell, God did not abandon man. He still started making provision by releasing his spirit, the spirit of Christ, that will bring about the salvation of mankind. So the plan for your salvation was even planned before you were born. Before anything happened, God had already sent his love. Now, there's somewhere in the scripture of God to read letter. It says, how much God have loved us. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Hallelujah. He did not upgrade us to become angels. He did not lift us to become 24 elders of, uh, or, or four living creatures or any other creature that lives in the heavenly realms. He made us to become his own children. You know the kind of love a mother has for his son or his daughter. Oh, sorry, for her son or her daughter. Mothers love their children so much. That is how the mother's love is what God has for children, not necessarily father's love. <laughs> you know, God really have the mother. He said, just like the hen gathers his cheek under his wing. That is how God gathers us under his wings. So, you see, God's love is more of the motherly love. You no, know, for father can just, you know, put her here and there. But the mother loves the children. So, that is how God loves you. No matter how a child is, I saw one child looks, you know, like, like a monkey. You know, they, they show it on television. Right? They look more like a monkey, living the bush, run up and down. Everybody was mocking the child. But the mother loved this child so, so, so very much that she continued until this child was sent to overseas to go and study. Today now he looks better. What I wanted to point out, it shows you if human being can love like that, you can imagine the, the gravity of God's love. That's a place we are going and I want you to understand the, the, the gravity and the power of his love first before you begin to understand his implication in your life. No matter how it is, have that consciousness in you. This class is to help us understand as believers the love of God you find yourself. Now, if you understand this love of God, that is when you can take advantage of it and come back to where you ought to be. An example is the prodigal son. The prodigal son is loved by the father, but he is prodigal. He lived in the land of the prodigal, land of waste. Eventually, when he realized himself and came back, the love of the father manifested in his life. Praise the Lord. The love that the Father manifested, he was the one who came back to the Father. So that you are not experiencing the flavors of the love of God in your life. It's not because God has stopped loving you. It is because you have taken yourself away and you can come back and enjoy that wonderful communion. Now, the dynamic there is that God's love carries so much power. The kind of power we as human beings do not have. We can't comprehend the kind of love God has for us. His love is seen in his son who has given us life. He said, so that we can live through him. So our life is carried by the son. He said he gave his son as a propitiation so that we can live through him. Now, the point here is that God knows that our greatest problem is that we will perish. Don't raise a sin. For God so loved the world, he gave his only should not what? Perish. So the key point is no matter how we try, we cannot help ourselves. He knows that without him, we will perish. We are dead forever without him. So knowing we can't love, he does not demand that we love him. You know, 
Sometimes we, we, we don't understand when we say, Bible say, love God, love God, love God. And you ask and say, well, I love God. You sure you love God. God knows that by the nature of the fallen status we have come into as a result of the fall, we on our own cannot have love for God. So God knowing that we cannot love him, he does not demand love from us. He rather asks us to receive his love. Hallelujah. He chose to love us and call us to accept his love, not to love him back. <laughs> this is the greatest kind of love. When somebody says, I love you, I don't care whether you love me or not. I love you. And I, I will do everything for you whether you love me or not. All you have to do is to accept my love. Don't love me back. Just accept it. Accept it. Is that not the biggest kind of love? Because naturally, a human being is selfish. Whenever a human being loves you, there is something he or she wants to gain from that love. God is not gaining anything special. You say you want to praise God. He has enough angels to praise him. You say you want to give him offering. What type of offering will you give to God? Silver is mine. Gold is mine. The earth is the loss and the fullness thereof. Just tell me one thing you can do for God that will make God become better than God. <laughs> you can never add to him or reduce him. So whatever he's doing for you, it is because of his own nature. And all he demands from you is to accept. Hallelujah. Our accepting his love, Jesus Christ, brings us not only the blessings that we can see in this life, but eternal life. And eternal life is the only life that God has. God's life is eternal. We have mortal life because of the fall. We are supposed to die. But the love, the life of God is eternal. When you become a kind of God by accepting that is love, you receive that life so that you become part and parcel of divinity. He said, His divine grace has shown us, has given us all that pertain to what? To life and godliness. And say, He has called us to be sharers of His divine nature. What is that? His divine nature? That is the love. Do you know that when you have received this life, and receive the love of God in you, it becomes bigger than you. That's why Paul said, the love of God constrains us. That is why someone can, can, can give his life for the preaching of the gospel. That's why someone can bring himself to the lowest ground just because of the gospel. Because it is not him. It is the love of God that constrains him. Paul said, the love of God does what? constrain us. So when that force of love, which is the life of God, lives in you, it begins to constrain you to do what you wouldn't have done as a normal, ordinary human being. Paul said that the Galatians say, you foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you? When you are saying, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere men? Meaning that we are not mere men. A young lady once said, oh, you must be afraid of me because I am half human and half spirit. I am half woman and half spirit. And look at her and say, you are half woman and half spirit. Unfortunately for you, I am full spirit and full woman. Hallelujah. You are half spirit and half woman. I am full woman and full spirit. So I am full spirit because I have the spirit of God that cannot die. And I am full woman because I am also physical as a human being. So 100%, just like Jesus was, 100% man and 100% God. Hallelujah. Now what I mean by that is that he's 100% man and 100% divine. And that divinity he has given to us in himself. So knowing we can't love, God does not demand us to love. He has decided to give us his love. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. What manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called. Now, let's look at this point carefully. Now, most times we hear people say that God commanded us to love. And say, if you want God to help you, you have to keep his commandment. And you ask them, what is the commandment? And number two, who can keep his commandment? Now, do you know that the commandment God gave Israel, we are more to help them seek him, not because he knew that they will keep it. Did Israel keep the law? In fact, from the day, the day he prepared the law was the first day they break the number one law. So, when God gives you a task that is bigger than you, it is simply telling you, help me, I cannot do it. You see? 
So when he says, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not, by your human nature, you cannot keep it. So what does he do? He offers you the grace so that by him, you can do it. That's why I say, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made manifest in your weakness. And Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. He said, what the law could not do, if you go to the next, the further verses, he said, what the Lord could not do, God did by sending his son. The law couldn't change the Israelites when they gave them the law. Even Adam and Eve, God gave them simple law. Do not eat this. Yet they ate it. It became the manifestation of the love of God that is to restore man. Because if man is to be restored by giving another law, he will keep breaking the law. That was saying, when you walk in the spirit, in other words, when you have received the spirit of love, which is the spirit of Christ in you, there is no law. Because God himself walks in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Say so the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to us. It now teaches us to say no to ungodliness. So when I don't do evil, it's not because, humanly speaking, I am not evil. It's because I have something greater than evil. I am no longer a mere human being. I am now a spirit of God. Hallelujah. It is said clearly in the scriptures, for if anyone be in Christ, he is a new being. The old nature is gone. The new nature has come. You see, so we do not walk by the human nature anymore, even though we are still in the flesh. We now walk by the Spirit, because the Spirit of Christ constrains us. Hallelujah. The Spirit of Christ carries us. Israel was given the commandment so that they can seek God. Unfortunately, they never knew that. And so they kept breaking the law and they kept dying. Why? Because the wages of sin is that if you break the law, you will bear the consequences of breaking the law. But if you realize that you cannot keep the law and ask for help, you will be saved. So if you say, oh, I can handle it. Some people will say, well, let me help you. Say, no, no, don't worry, I can handle it. Don't worry, I can handle it. Yeah, at, at the end of the day, they can't handle it. Oh, no, 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 this is what we can handle it. God is telling you this thing, you cannot carry it. That's why the Bible says, when the Israelites fought the battles, that brought them victory. He said, it was not their sword that fought the battle for them. It was him himself, God. You see, even when the Israelites went from Egypt to the promised land, he said it was not them that went. He carried them in his wings. He carried them on his wing. So you see, now, when you are in Christ and you have received this love of God in you, you are no longer the one operating. It is this love that starts operating in you, making you to walk in the way God would have walked. You hate what God hates. You love what God loves. You, you, you fight what God fights. You accept what God accepts. Even when, humanly speaking, you wouldn't have been able, but there's something beyond you. That is the dynamic of God's love. Something beyond you works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Hallelujah. Somebody says, oh, it's because you are daring. It's not because you are daring. He said, God has chosen the weak things of the world to confine the wise. Anybody who rejects God's love is telling God, I, am, I can handle myself. I am better. I can do it. I can handle it. From the day you do that, you are on your own. Even though God loves you, you are, you are the only one that can carry yourself. Unfortunately, your, your elasticity is too small to take you to eternity. It's just like the frog. You know, there's a story, the, 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 the frog, the child of the frog came back to the frog and said, I saw an elephant, and the elephant is very big. The mother said, how big? So very big. And the mother frog started to inflate, uh, into swell himself up, inflate himself. As he was inflating himself, getting bigger and bigger, he said, my, my son, uh, is it like this? He said, no, she increased more. Like this, he said, no, she increased more. Like this, she, the child said, no. He kept increasing and increasing until, boom, exploded and died. Because you cannot carry it. For example, you know, when Jesus Christ came, he was talking about some laws. And he says, it is said to you in those days in, of old, do not commit adultery. And, this, and I said to you, 
Anyone who looks at a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery in his heart. Now, when you hear this statement, you say, see, you see, it is not, Jesus Christ is not trying to tell you, uh, 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 you see, you see, look, look at what happened there. You may be saying, oh, I have not committed adultery because I have not gone to sleep with any woman. So I have not committed adultery. So I am justified. I am qualified. I can get everything that God has because I have been able to keep that law. And Jesus said, oh, you cannot keep the law. He said, oh, but I kept it. Have you ever seen me commit adultery with any woman? And Jesus said, okay, let's say you have kept the law. But look at the, 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 the foundation of the law. Look at what the law actually means. Anyone who looks at a woman and lusts after her, in other words, you look at a woman and you begin to begin to like her beauty. <laughs> you have you have committed adultery. Okay. And you know that men have that eye. When they see, if they say, oh, oh, they see beautiful woman, they look at you, they say, ah, this woman is beautiful. And then they come to their senses. By the time you do that, if the law is to be applied on you, you have committed adultery. So Jesus Christ is telling you that you cannot, you need me. You need me. He said, oh, thou shalt not kill. I have not killed anybody before. I have not killed anybody before. Said, anybody who hates his brother is a murderer. Okay. And that, that word hate means malice or malicious thought. Malicious thought is that if I am given the opportunity, I will kill. As long as it is in your heart that, you know, some people have that malicious thought that you even use prayer to carry it out. You use prayer to kill. <laughs> I remember somebody said in their church, they kill. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, if you have that malicious thought so much so that if your eyes were gone, you would have used it to shoot. You are a mother already. You see, God is telling you that there are situations in your life where people do things to you that you 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 say, hey, oh, oh, that oh, oh makes you a mother. You see, so if you must live above that oh, oh, you need Jesus. It takes the spirit of love in Christ to make you not to do oh, oh. So when you see somebody who is saying he's living a holy life, it is not by his effort because your own effort can never help you. That is why the love of God is needed in your life. The power of God's love will constrain you to love others. What do you mean by loving others? It's not emotional feeling. It's not sentimental feeling. Don't know if you have some butterfly in your stomach. No. It is being selfless to another person. Hallelujah. And by your own strength, you can never do it. No human being can do it. You see, Moses, who even gave the law, break the law, and was killed by the law. So Christ was given to save us from that. And Christ is the love of God. Receiving Christ is receiving, receiving the love of God. And receiving the love of God is receiving the power of God that will help you to please God. Hallelujah. Now, since... He knows that we will sin, and that sin will lead us to death. By his own choice, he sent his son to break the power of death, so that because of his son, which is his love, we can live and not perish. Death cannot keep us in his grip, because we possess the spirit of resurrection in us through Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, he said, if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. That same spirit will quicken your mortal body. In other words, will transform your mortal body into celestial body. So because of Christ, we have received the spirit of resurrection. We have the power of resurrection operating in us, meaning that death has no power over us because death has no power over Christ. Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered death. The same power of love in you is what conquers death. The spirit of love is the spirit of Christ. Hallelujah. And that spirit is given to you as a gift. The gift of God, which produces what? Eternal life. Hallelujah. Now, this is the enormous power of God. In this was made manifested the love of God to us because that God sent his only son that we might have life through him. So, what we are pointing out here is that it's not about saying, oh, I love God, I love God, I love God. You might love God all you like in your own statement, but the truth is that you don't love God. I'm going to prove it to you. Now, let's read Romans chapter 9, verse 10 to 18. It says, 
And not only this, I want to prove us to us, first of all, how God loves us by his own choice. It's not because we love him that he loved us. So don't be bragging, I love God. Oh, I love God. Cool down. Understand this. He says, Romans chapter 9, verse 10 to 18. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done anything good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that will it, nor of him that run it, but of God that showed mercy. For the scripture said unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose I have raised thee, that I might show forth my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout the earth. Therefore, had he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and harden whom he will harden. Now, look at it. God said, I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy, and I will harden, or I will, I will not show mercy to whom I don't want to show mercy. You say, okay, that means God has chosen the people he can show mercy to. That's right. God has chosen the people he will show mercy to, and the people he will not show mercy to. Who are those people? In his son. Anybody who comes into his son, who accepts his love, have enrolled into his mercy. So it is not that God is going around looking for those. Okay, you, I will show mercy on you. You, I will not show mercy on you. You, I will show mercy on you. He's saying that God have released his mercy, but God commanded his love towards us. In that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. But the benefit of that death cannot be seen, except you accept that Christ, who is the love of God. You understand him? So if you say, uh, it, is, it is not of him that will it, nor of him that run it, but of God that show it mercy. Yes, the mercy of God is for everyone who enrolls for it. For example, again, somebody have said, oh, we are giving some food items to people in social and so community. Everybody from this community come and take this, maybe a bag of rice. And then, they have put the list, come and put your name down. As soon as the rice come, we'll call from the list. And you are a member of that community and you refuse to put your name there. Do you know what that means? It means that you will not get that rice, even though your own is there. A good example is what happened during our graduation ceremony. We decided that we are going to give every graduand a Bible, a brand new Bible. And now, Everybody was counted, and the number of Bible needed for everybody was brought. Now, one of the graduates, unfortunately, didn't show up. Hallelujah. Every other, all the other graduates received their Bible one by one. But the other one who didn't come did not receive. The Bible is there. But because he didn't come, the Bible no longer belongs to him. You understand what I'm talking about? So, the same thing, God's love. And the power that will make you to walk in his ways without your own effort has been released. But whosoever believeth, that's a condition there. He's, he loves you, but that love does not make any meaning to you except you receive it. Hebrew chapter 4 tells us something very important. It says, the message that they received, that we are receiving today, the people of old, they also received the same message, but they did not mix it with faith, and so it did not profit them. So, God can package wonderful things for you, but that thing will not profit you. Not that that thing does not have profit. I remember in those days when we were children, if you are sick and your mother wants to give you medicine, you know, you, 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 it gives you the medicine, you put it into your mouth and use your tongue to hide it one side. And then you drink the water. And when, 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 your, when your mother goes out, you bring out the medicine and you throw it away. And then your mother will be wondering, ah, this child is not getting well. You are not getting the benefit of the medicine because you refuse to swallow it. 
The medicine had all it takes to make you what the pharmacists say to make you, but you have refused to swallow it. So, the essence tonight is we must stop rejecting God's love. Understand this fact, that this love of God is based on his choice. His choice is for all who what? Who believe. He has chosen us in Christ. Esau represents those who don't believe. Jacob represents those who believe. And so when you believe in Christ, you are chosen. You are elected. You are the elect of God. Hallelujah. And let's see the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 30. It says, And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. I'm going to tell you what that means. For those who love him, who have been called. Who have what? Been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also what? Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That we might that he might become the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Hallelujah. Now, look at the terms of that scripture that I just read here. He says, all things work together for good to those who love God. So a preacher may be tempted to say, you see, you have to love God. You have to love God. And he asks, Pastor, please, how do I love God? He said, for God so loved the world that he gave. So if you want to show your love for God, you have to give. Giving is a proof of love. <laughs> and because you gave an offering, you gave the tithe, or you gave something, you say you love God. <laughs> Even those who hate God can give. So giving is not a proof of love. Anybody can give you anything and yet does not love you. Haven't you experienced it in your own life? Somebody can give, buy, even buy you a house and yet not love you. Somebody can do any good thing for you that when people say, oh, this, how, how, oh, how he loves her. Oh, how, haven't you seen? A man can, it's just like when you buy a goat eh, for Christmas, you feed the goat. You buy food for the goat. You will get grass for the goat to eat. You will do everything for the goat to eat. The goat will be doing, nah, oh, this man loves me. Oh, how he loves me. You think he loves you? On Christmas Day, you will know how much he loves you. You see, election is around the corner. The politicians are becoming lovers of the people. They will come to your community to make root for you. Just because election is near, they will be, they will tell you good. My good people, the good people of Oshimiri Kingdom, the good people, calling you good people, smiling. They can even come to your shop and sit down beside you. They can even donate any account of what they want is what they want you to give them their vote. Once that vote comes, everything he has given to you, collect it back. I pray we we'll have better politicians this time around. But that is how human love is. You see, so that you, you gave, you gave something to God. Because even these days, the giving is tied with strings. All right? God, I'm giving you this money so that you can give me this. I'm giving this so that I can give me this. You give God 1,000 CDs so that God can give you 100,000 CDs. Is that love? Is that love? Somebody say, oh, Pastor, I've been giving, giving you. I'm not seeing anything. Uh, and you say it was giving. I thought it was giving. You are giving. <laughs> you are giving, giving. You are not seeing anything. But are you expecting something? <laughs> You know what Jesus Christ said? When you are giving, give to somebody who cannot give you back. Not somebody, oh, I'm giving you something. You are having your wedding. I came, I bought you a car. So that when I'm having my own wedding, you, bought me, you buy me a trailer. Hmm. So, say, when it said, for all things work together for good, for those who love God. Who? Who are those who love God? These are the people who has, he has called according to his purpose. Now, when there is a calling, there should be an answer. So those who love God are those who have responded to the love of God by receiving that love in them sincerely. I don't mean those who accept Jesus, who accept Jesus Christ because they need deliverance. You know, some pastor can come and say, oh, we're going to have deliverance service, but if you want God to do something for you, you need to be born again. So pray this prayer with me. So that after the prayer, we can now pray. So I said that we don't have root. So you are, you are accepting Christ as it were is because you want to break some yokes in your life. You know, there are some bond, some frustrations you are facing. So if I give my life to Christ, the power of God will now respond to me. Do not, even if you don't give your life to Christ, if you pray sincerely, God will answer you. And you see, go to hell. <laughs> that is the thing. So that giving life to Christ that you just did is not really true. Because it is not from your heart. 
Even in giving, ordinary giving, Jesus said, give cheerfully. Giving with all your heart. Hallelujah. So those who love him are those who have responded to the call which is made according to the purpose of God for you. And what is that purpose of God? The purpose of God is for you to conform to the image of his son. That is what he has predestined you, who is to believe, to accept, and to conform to. Hallelujah. So those who love him are those who accept his love. God has decided before the foundation of the world what the destiny of those who accept him in his son will be. They are to become his sons with all the rights and privileges. Praise the Lord. Now, we are about running off this uh, lesson tonight, but take this. We must understand that whatever God does for us is not because we love him. He does it by what? By choice. The point here is when people say that the secret of my success is because I love God so much. Oh, I love God so, so, so very much. That is why I'm succeeding. They are not talking about the love of God. But human affection that has a note of selfish, selfishness in it. You are doing so, so that you can get back. In fact, the returns are the inner motivation of that so-called love. God does not do things for you because you did things for him, I said earlier. He does things for you because he chose to. And you are committed to it by faith. Now, your faith is what makes you receive that thing that God has done for you. First Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 9, you read down. One of the verses there says, we have not received the spirit that is of the world, but the spirit that is of God, so that we can know what God has what? Freely, freely given. In Romans chapter 8, it says, If he can give us his only son, what else can he not freely give? So if you have been buying favor from God, it is not God's favor you are getting. You are going to the market to buy. God, God's favor is not for sale. God's love is not for sale. It's for receiving. Eh? One woman said, life is about give and take. You give and I take. God's love is he gives to you and then you take it. And when you take it, that is when your faith can start working. The Bible says, faith worketh by love. What does that mean? Faith is the key. To all God has given up to you in love. And those things are wrapped up in his grace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. You take time to go read that. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. So, faith that worketh by love means that it is the love of God that makes faith to work. If God can give you Jesus which is the manifestation of his love, there is nothing else he cannot give to you in addition. No man has this kind of love. It can only be in you when you have received this life of God in you and that life rules your heart. It is to be seen in your love by how you, you know, that love I'm talking about now, this love of God you have received will be manifested on how you now love other people unconditionally. Now, let me tell you, love unconditionally doesn't mean that you will tolerate nonsense. Are you understanding me now? If I have my child and, my, and I love my child and my child is a stupid child, I will flog that child. I will flog the hell out of him. He says, it is the child that you love that you chastise. If your parents does not chastise you, it's the proof that they don't love you. I know school, some school teachers who like flogging children for nothing. But when I flog any student, I am flogging the child because I love that child. I was so happy the other day when one of my students on Facebook wrote and said, you are the best teacher ever. I was very happy. When that child was in primary five and I taught that child, I flogged them. Today she is a medical doctor. And she's married and have her children. Now on Facebook, she's now pretty. And I'm happy because I was doing those things to help them. I remember one of the children, I flogged the hell out of him. Today, 
he is, I think he's an engineer. The father sent me a message some years back and said, your son is doing very well. But that boy was one of the dumbest boy in class. But when I flogged him and positioned him to learn, he was changed. So when you say, I love you, if you love somebody, anything, the person what? You give him. He said, I want this, you give him. I want that. That thing will kill him, you give him. You are trying to say, I want sweet every day, you give him sweet. His teeth is spoiling, you are giving him sweet. You don't love him. So God's love for you does not mean that he will not chastise you. When you misbehave, he will chastise you. That's part of the proof of his love. And so when you love anybody, you will correct that person, not with hatred, but with love. He may look in the eyes of people that, oh, look at how you are flogging this child. Look at how you are rebuking this child. Look at how you are doing. You are doing that thing so that the child will repent. It's not hatred. It is rather you who is in, having the child to be indulging, indulging in, in frivolous and stupid characters that you are the one that hate the child. There's a story of this boy who, you know, he goes to school, he, he steals, he comes back, he, he brings it home. The mother will not say anything. He kept doing that until he graduated to armed robbery. Eventually, he, he, he was arrested with other members of his gang and they tied them for firing squad. They asked him, what last favor do you want the government to show you before you are killed? He said, he want to see his mother. And they sent for the mother. The mother came, oh, oh, my son, oh, my son, oh, my son. He called the mother, mama, please come, let me tell you something before I die. <laughs> you know, and the, the mother, oh, my son, she brought her ears to the, the boy. <clears throat> she bought bit off the, ear, the mother's ear. Oh, that's why. He said, all this time I have been misbehaving. You never corrected me one day. It was you that made me to graduate to become an arm robber. In fact, this firing squad, me and you supposed to die. That was when the woman realized how foolish she was. So love does not mean that you don't rebuke. Love does not mean that you don't correct. Love does not mean that you give anything anybody asks. Oh, I give you. That, that, that's not love. Love carries the power to mold, to change, to transform a life. So how do I know that someone loves me? The person is interested in my welfare and corrects me when I am wrong and rebukes me when I am wrong and be behave foolishly and act as if I am right. You understand me now? Now, you correct me and I, and I get angry at your correction, I will still correct you and still rebuke you because I love you. If I hate you, I will not say anything. I will not correct you. You put your hand to fire. Okay. You want to die? Okay. That's not love. Some love is, can be manifested in slapping. You can slap the person you love to her so that his head can come back. So, the love of man will only do things to benefit himself. But the love of God does things for the other person's benefit. And it is only when this love of God is in your heart and rules your heart that you can ever do anything selflessly. Hallelujah. Now, we are in the world today. When somebody is doing something selflessly, people suspect him, ah, this, way, this, way, this way this person is helping me. Like, are you sure? Are you, are you sure? Are you sure? You know, we live in a selfish world that every good thing is looked at suspiciously. A sister saw a young brother in the church who is a university student and said that the boy is struggling every time. Whenever he's going to school, he has to be begging. She called him and said, I will sponsor your education. She's unmarried and the young man is about her age, but she's working. She has money. She started paying the young man's school fees, buying him provisions, giving him everything he wanted. This young man was so excited. I saw this lady, this thing is doing for me. She wants me to marry her. That's why she's doing it. It's no problem. When I finish, I'll go and propose marriage to her. And then after he graduated, he, he, he told the lady, I'm coming to your family house to visit you. She said, okay. She came to the family house. She, uh, he came to the family house of the lady. And then she, he sat down. The, fa the father was there. The father had already taken him as if he's their son. And so he sat down. And in the presence of the father and the mother, he said, Will you marry me? And the lady looked at him and said, who, what, what, what are you talking about? He said, eh? He said, no, 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 no. I am engaged and I will soon be getting married. He said, but why were you doing all this way? Oh, I saw a brother in need and I decided to help out. 
I was not intending you to oh, sorry for misleading you. Please. That is not my intention. And he was so ashamed of himself. He said he felt that the ground should open for him to fall inside. He has miscalculated. That somebody is showing you love and kindness does not mean that he requires something back from you. Uh, there are some ladies who come to a man. You have been so nice to me. Okay, you remove that. Come and sleep with me. I know that that is what you want. Who told you that every man look, likes you because he wants to sleep with you? So don't always see any good kind gesture as an a, 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 as a selfish act to to deserve what you can offer back. That one is not good love. Good love is unconditional. So when it is said that God loves you unconditionally. It is like God giving you his ATM card and say, use it for all your need. Like the good Samaritan who helped the man that was knocked down on the way and gave his credit card as it were and say, whatever else this man may need, take from me, is on me. That is what God has done. And so when it is said, faith working by love, it means that it is the love of God that makes your faith to work. Without God's love, your faith will produce only as much as your human efforts can carry. But if it is founded on God's love, it can go beyond measure. So the Bible says once again, hearing is love. Not that we love God, but that he loves us and sent his son as a propitiation for our sin. In conclusion tonight, let us read this passage of the scripture. We have read it before and I want to read it again. So that you can understand it and think about it. And from there, you are going to do an assignment. For those of you who are students, there's an assignment for you from what I'm going to read right now. It says, and we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God. And God remains in him. In this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment take note so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment for we are as he is in this world there is no fear in love instead perfect love drives out fear because fear involves torment so the one who fears is not made perfect in love we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet maliciously hates his brother, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother he has seen cannot love the God that he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God also loves his brother. Hallelujah. There is no malicious act. That word malice means evil intention. So it's to say malicious look. You are looking at me with an intention to commit harm. You know, malicious act is an act that is done with the intention to commit harm. So when the word hate is used there, it's not like when God says, I hate this or I hate that. That word hate is uh, an English word that is used you know, translated from sometimes from Latin or, or, or Greek into English word, sometimes it has so many meanings with it. So the meaning of the word hate as used in this passage is malicious intention. Anybody who maliciously think about another person, malicious, with intention to hurt the person, with intention to destroy the person, whether it is through prayer or it's through physical weapon or through anything, as long as that, that's malicious intention, it is hate. So, he said, anybody who have this malicious thought and malicious intention for his brother cannot say he is in the love of God. Now, that place I said, cannot say he loves God. No. Cannot say he has received the love of God. Because if he has received the love of God, that malicious intention will not be in your heart. Because the Spirit of God, he said, the love of God has been shared abroad. In our heart. Hallelujah. Now tonight's topic has been the dynamics of God's love. The power of God's love. It's so powerful in the sense that it is not as a result of what you have done. It is as a result of his choice. 
And the only way you can enjoy the benefit of this love is by accepting that love. And who is the manifestation of that love? Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for opening our eyes further into the dynamics of your love. We know that this is not much. We have not even learned anything as far as your love. Because the Bible says it is so deep and so wide that we cannot even fathom how wide and big it is. And so we rely, we rely on your spirit to continue to open our heart and take us deeper, deeper in the love of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who is opening his or her own heart tonight to receive that love. May the power of that love begin to work. And for many who have already received but have become prodigal in the sense that they have kept that love aside even though they have received Christ, that Christ is not the Lord of their life. In other words, the love is not ruling their heart. As they are opening themselves up tonight, I trust that this love of God will flow like a river and encapsulate their entire soul. And the manifestation will be something that the whole world will see and say, what manner of love is this? Lord, we trust you to take us to this level as we grow in grace through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen and amen. Amen. We've come to the end of the class, but before we go, you give your offering. If you are giving your offering, you just ask for the way you can send it across and it shall be made known to you. Father, accept our offering we give to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you for being in class today. For those of you who are students, please go to the uh, assignment segment and then you do your assignment. If you didn't get it, ask me and I will send you the assignment. You need to do it. The assignment says, meditate on the scripture we have just read. That is 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 to 27. Meditate on that scripture and send in your understanding. What did you understand? And in general, look at the entire lesson and send me a full comprehensive write-up of what you understood from the lesson we have taken tonight. That is your exam, actually. If you don't write it, then you write an exam, which will be difficult. So this is an assignment for you. You do it. God bless you. I will see you again on Thursday. Bye-bye.